You're standing in a room full of explosive gas. One spark could cause an explosion so powerful that all the windows and doors would be just blown out with a huge column of fire. And you're holding a match. You need a bigger target than this room. How about the largest room of explosive gas in our entire solar system? Meet Jupiter. It's the fifth planet from the Sun and the largest one in our system. It's 11 times the width of Earth and almost two and a half times heavier than all the other planets in our solar system combined. If we put Jupiter on the scales, we would need about 317 Earths to balance it. But most importantly, it has a lot of methane in its atmosphere. It's the gas we use in our kitchen or fill up our car with, and it burns just fine. More importantly, there's metallic hydrogen. In its normal state, hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe. But on Jupiter, it's at great pressure, more than 400 million atmospheres. By comparison, on Earth, you feel the pressure of one atmosphere. So multiply that by 400 million, and hydrogen is compressed so much that it looks like liquid metal. Metallic hydrogen can be a great fuel. It'll give off 20 times more energy than burning ordinary hydrogen. So you and your match can have great fun out there. Okay, here we go. The first problem is distance. Jupiter is only one planet away from us, but the path is also blocked by the asteroid belt behind Mars. It's full of giant rock debris. On average, each asteroid could be as wide as the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. There's rocks the size of an entire state. And the biggest asteroid of them all is Ceres. It's almost as wide as Alaska. It's even considered a dwarf planet. And this dangerous journey to Jupiter takes about 650 days. That's almost two years of boredom inside a spaceship. By comparison, the longest time astronauts have spent aboard a spaceship is 84 days. But we'll let you take your favorite DVD collection and a couple bags of popcorn. At the end of the day, you'll be able to get some sleep after a hard day at work. Fast forward two years into the future, and you've arrived at your destination. You're already imagining lighting a match at the surface of Jupiter, exploding it like a balloon. Oh, be careful when you get close to it. Because of Jupiter's great weight, it has a strong gravitational force, about three times stronger than back home on Earth. The closer you get to its surface, the weaker you feel, and you can even barely stand on your feet. The maximum weight you can lift here is also three times less and even a match you're holding in your hand already feels heavier. If you try to jump up, you need more effort. Actually, you can't even do that because Jupiter is a gas giant. That means it has no solid surface. Theoretically, the deeper you dive into these clouds, the more pressure you'll feel. Gradually, the clouds and gases thicken and form a kind of liquid. But you don't have to dive that deep. Methane is a light gas, and it's closer to the surface. So, this is the moment of truth. You take a match, you flick it on the box, and nothing happens. Well, let's give it a couple more tries. Second match. Third. Ugh, nothing works. Okay, you've got a gas burner in your backpack. You unscrew the valve to maximum, and nothing happens again. Well, that's because it takes three components to start the combustion process. The first is fuel. Luckily, there's enough methane and metallic hydrogen on Jupiter to blow up the whole planet in a matter of seconds. The second component is the ignition source. It's the initial force that will start the combustion process. It could be a spark, an electrical discharge, or a match like the one you have in your hand. And the last ingredient is oxygen. Yes, the same oxygen that we breathe. It's just as important to fire as the fuel itself. For an experiment, try lighting a small candle. Now cover it with a glass. You see how the fire keeps burning for a few seconds and then goes out? The fuel is still there, but the fire has used up all the oxygen inside the glass and the burning process is over. The same thing happens on Jupiter. There just can't be fire simply because there's no oxygen. And you didn't even have to fly there to find that out. From Earth, we can see hundreds of thousands of little meteorites falling on Jupiter. The asteroid belt next to it is to blame for this. When they hit its atmosphere, they start to burn, and that doesn't instantly blow up the entire planet. 
But don't be upset. There's still a way to ignite this gas giant planet. All you have to do is trigger a thermonuclear chain reaction on the planet. Then, there'll be an explosion so powerful, it'll be visible from Earth. And it will be like the birth of a new star. To do that, we need to detonate a nuclear reactor, like the ones that give us electricity here on Earth. In fact, we'd have to send everything we have to Jupiter. But even that won't do the trick. Big asteroids, when they hit the planet, cause a much bigger explosion. In 2009, a meteorite the size of five soccer fields hit Jupiter. It caused an explosion of five billion tons of TNT. This incident left a dark spot the size of the Pacific Ocean. And an even bigger explosion happened there in 1994. After that collision, there was a giant spot on Jupiter almost the size of our planet. But strong winds and storms quickly began to sweep away the traces of the explosion. After a few weeks, Jupiter looked like normal. The problem is that our attempts to blow up the gas giant took place on the planet's surface. We need to plant a charge the size of the moon deep below. A massive explosion will cause a thermonuclear reaction and cause the metallic hydrogen to detonate. The explosive process is set, and within seconds, Jupiter explodes like a giant balloon. But this spectacle will be the last one that humanity ever sees. The explosion would disturb the stable orbits of Earth and the other planets. The trajectory of Earth around the Sun might change, and we may see the dawn not in the east, but on any other side of the world. When the strong wind from the explosion reaches the Earth, it'll start scraping our atmosphere. Soon, our planet will lose its ozone layer. It was our shield that protected us from solar radiation. In such a situation, we'll have to hide underground for the rest of our lives. But even this can't protect us. Before long, the Earth will be showered with thousands of meteorites. Jupiter was so heavy that it held the asteroid belt in place. Without it, the asteroids would start flying towards us. Earth would feel a constant meteor shower. But there would be no one left on Earth to observe it anymore. Jupiter's explosion can be compared to a supernova. In fact, Jupiter is practically a star. If it were just a little bigger and heavier, it would start to shrink. The intense pressure on the planet's core would start thermonuclear reactions. Eventually, Jupiter will have turned into a brown dwarf. And it would be 50 times heavier than it is now. But because it doesn't have enough weight to do that, Jupiter is sometimes called a failed star. Well, maybe we should visit other gas planets in our solar system and try to light our match there. Saturn. Saturn's atmosphere is similar to Jupiter, but there's no oxygen for combustion there either. So all you have to do is admire the planet's beautiful rings and move on. Well, Uranus and Neptune are much smaller, and they don't have metallic hydrogen, so their explosion wouldn't be as strong. But you still wouldn't be able to ignite them with a match, because there's no atmosphere full of oxygen. But there is one planet where you could light a fire with your match, it's GJ1132b, and it's 39 light years away. Scientists think it might have oxygen on it, although it's not a gas giant that has combustible gases in its atmosphere. But you can still sit on its rocky ground and make a fire to admire the unusual sunset. Imagine leaving your house one morning and seeing not one, but two stars shining in the sky. The first one is our good old sun, and the other is... Jupiter! But how has a planet turned into a star? And what will now happen to Earth and its inhabitants? Before we find the answer to these urgent questions, we need to revise some things we know about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system is a gas giant, which means it's made up mostly of gases. Due to the pressure and temperature differences, these gases separate into layers. This creates those red and white bands that can be clearly seen from Earth. The temperatures at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere are insane. They can reach a whopping 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet also has an immense gravitational pull. In 1995, the Galileo probe reached the atmosphere of Jupiter and sliced it at a speed of 106,000 miles per hour. It survived the scorching temperatures and started its descent. It kept moving even when the temperature suddenly dropped and the pressure, as well as the speed of the wind, increased. 
but 58 minutes and 97 miles into its exploration, things went downhill. The pressure of 23 atmospheres and still high temperatures finished the probe off. It was melted and then vaporized by the extreme heat. Now, if Jupiter suddenly decided to keep growing, it would eventually become a star, and its composition would allow this planet to do it. Once, a long, long time ago, Jupiter took most of the mass that was left after the formation of our Sun. That's how it ended up with more than twice the combined material of all other bodies in the solar system. And the planet's ingredients are the same as those of a star, mostly hydrogen and helium. Jupiter is just not massive enough to ignite. But what if it was? Then it would turn into another kind of celestial body, most likely a brown dwarf. In this case, it would have a minor effect on the orbits of the planets of our solar system, because brown dwarfs are more massive than planets, but not as massive as stars. A brown dwarf is usually 13 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter. It can only become a star if the pressure in its core gets high enough to start nuclear fusion. So let's imagine that it's happened, and Jupiter has become a real star. For example, a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars with masses around 7.5% to 50% of the mass of our Sun. Red dwarfs are also hotter than brown dwarfs. Their temperature can reach 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit. Our Sun, by comparison, has a temperature of almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it means that the newly formed red dwarf will be far dimmer than the Sun. And still, red dwarf Jupiter could prevent the inner planets from following their orbits, because they wouldn't be able to find a balance between the gravitational forces of the two stars. The planets would move either closer to the Sun or closer to the newly formed red dwarf. If Earth chose the first option, our main star's insane temperatures would probably wipe all living beings off the face of the Earth in no time. If it was the second scenario, we'd probably freeze, since Jupiter, as a dim red dwarf, wouldn't be able to warm us up well enough. But there could be one more option. The inner planets could get thrown out of the solar system altogether. If Jupiter was a star, it would also greatly increase the amount of radiation the surface of Earth would receive. Our atmosphere would have to protect us both from the radiation coming from the Sun and from Jupiter's radiation. Red dwarfs are notoriously active. That's why Jupiter, just like the Sun, would most likely have frequent coronal mass ejections. This is a fancy expression for describing large clouds of electrically charged particles a star releases with a huge burst of speed. Even now, Jupiter has a significant impact on our planet. The gas giant is roughly 318 times as massive as Earth. And this also means it has an outsized pull on our planet. Its gravity can cause shifts in the orbit of our planet and climate swings every 400,000 years or so. When Jupiter's influence is the strongest, Earth usually has colder winters, hotter summers, and more intense periods of wetness and droughts. Also, if Jupiter turned into a red dwarf, its most prominent feature might probably disappear for good. I'm talking about the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts tower more than five miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is almost twice as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The great red spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. They were higher than the temperature of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm 
might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear altogether. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. And now, I have another what-if situation for you. What if Jupiter collided with the smallest star we know about? Today, these two space bodies are on a collision course. A spoiler, Earth might not survive such an encounter. Okay, meet this tiny red dwarf. It's the size of Saturn, and its gravity is around 300 times the gravity of our planet. It normally floats 600 light years away from Earth in a double star system. But today, for some inexplicable reason, it's broken all the laws of the universe and is rushing toward the biggest gas giant in our solar system. And even though this space guest is smaller than Jupiter, its mass is way greater, and its gravitational force soon starts to pull on the gas giant. The heat from the red dwarf, plus its powerful gravity, makes Jupiter grow in size. The planet's atmosphere starts to puff up because the gases that make up the planet begin to heat up and expand. Jupiter's atmosphere starts to leak into space toward the stellar visitor. Sometime later, the runaway gases form a bright hot ring around the red dwarf. This is a terrifying view, as if a black hole, a very bright one, has appeared inside the solar system. The star keeps tearing Jupiter apart, eating chunks of the gas giant. And soon, the red dwarf engulfs it completely. Sadly, Jupiter never stood a chance. Instead of the gas giant, we now have a red dwarf surrounded by a ring of hot gases. And we already know how badly it may end. The best thing about it is that this scenario is totally imaginary. Phew, thank goodness. Hey, wake up! Quick, listen to that. It's a 5-second FM signal coming from one of Jupiter's moons. You fumble for your phone and inform your colleagues. They freak out over the news and rush to the lab. You've been a scientist working with the Juno probe, exploring Jupiter for years. But this is the first time you've witnessed something so unusual. Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon and the biggest moon in our solar system. If this space body didn't orbit around Jupiter, it would be classified as a planet. It's even bigger than Mercury and Pluto. What makes this moon stand out among others is the fact that it has its own magnetic field. The moon was born around 4.5 billion years ago. It means it's as old as Jupiter itself. This planet-sized space body takes 7 Earth days to orbit its planet. Everyone gathers at the laboratory, impatiently waiting for you to play the recording of the signal coming from space. Your colleagues get their game on, trying to figure out what the source of this mysterious sound is. Around 40% of Ganymede's surface is dark, with craters scattered around. And 60% is light-colored. There are formations that were probably caused by tectonic activity or the release of water from under the surface. Scientists managed to discover a thin layer of oxygen trapped in the Moon's atmosphere. The temperatures there are super low, between minus 170 to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. There isn't much information about how the Moon behaves or what chemical elements it hides inside. Some of your colleagues try to create the same conditions that existed when the sound was transmitted. For hours, they sit there waiting, but nothing. Maybe it was a fluke. You get to the control system and activate the Juno spacecraft. The main point of this mission is to observe Jupiter's gravity, magnetic fields, the atmosphere, and the planet's evolution. By the way, there's also some evidence that Jupiter's largest moon is evolving too. Since it has a magnetic field surrounding it, auroras pop up all the time. 
Those are glowing gas circling the moon's north and south poles. If life existed in such a place, it would probably be at the bottom of Ganymede's extremely salty ocean. For a long time, scientists thought that the sun was a crucial component to kickstart life. But now we know that there are organisms dwelling deep at the bottom of the oceans. Those are doing just fine without sunlight. The oceans of our planet are teeming with some of the most bizarre creatures of all shapes and sizes. Sea lilies live some 10,000 feet underwater. They got their name because they look like flowers. Except they're not plants, but animals. Don't be fooled by their stems and leaves. Those are body parts equipped with nerve endings to detect food around them. Goblin sharks are probably some of the most weird-looking sharks that live at the bottom of the ocean. They can grow up to 12 feet long and have a very unusual snout. Now, take a look at the anglerfish. It has a bioluminescent blob on its head to attract prey and navigate its way around the dark ocean floor. It's a natural flashlight that never needs new batteries. It's only the females that have these flashlights, though. The blobfish is another bizarre animal living down there. It lives in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, 9,000 feet under the surface. Anyway, even though you asked everyone to keep the news confidential, it somehow leaks to the media and becomes a new trending topic. You get a call from a news agency. They say they want to interview you about this breakthrough that may prove life exists in outer space. The next day, you head down to the news station to talk about your discovery. You have a whole live studio audience watching your every move as you reach out to grab your glass of water. The crew scurries around doing some last-minute checkups before you're live on air. The makeup artist does some final brush-ups. The sound engineer asks you to test your mic once more. Several of the producers are sitting in the front seats. Bright lights are flooding the studio. The countdown begins. 3, 2, 1, and… You're introduced, and the host asks you to explain what it was that you heard. You tell them about the Juno space probe orbiting Jupiter. After a couple of questions, the host finally brings up the most dreaded one. Might the mysterious sound be coming from another civilization? Everyone leans in, waiting for you to answer. You freeze, not knowing what to say. Even though the crushing pressure at the bottom of the ocean is a thousand times stronger than at sea level, life still exists there. Algae, which is considered a delicacy in the ocean world, is off-menu for deep-sea creatures due to a lack of sunlight. Many of these bottom dwellers have to munch on leftovers instead. Those sink down there from the upper layers of the ocean. The freezing temperatures and the intense pressure have altered the cells of these creatures. This has made them more resilient than the average fish. Bacteria were developing their own ways of surviving. Studies show that they feed on certain gases and chemicals, like sulfur and carbon dioxide. Methane and hydrogen are released when tectonic plates move it against each other. And some of these bacteria feast upon those gases, too. Tardigrades, also known as water bears, are microscopic critters that can live and thrive in extreme conditions. You can find them in volcanoes, frozen glaciers, and even in the empty void of space. Which means that some life forms might actually exist on Ganymede. You explain this to your audience. Then you mention that you don't have enough information to determine if it was another civilization or a natural phenomenon that produced the sound. This doesn't mean that the bottom of Ganymede's freezing oceans isn't teeming with its own bizarre and weird creatures. There might be some legendary beasts like the kraken or leviathan there. Or weird glowing fish with two heads. A fish with tentacles and a large fin. Giant crabs. The bacteria there might be as varied as our own. The plants, if they exist there, have to be strong enough to survive the sub-zero temperatures. The animals on Jupiter's largest moon could be as big as our blue whales or as tiny as plankton. After the interview, you head back to the lab to examine the records once more. On your way home, you see posters of yourself with captions like, Are we not alone? Hey, you've become a celebrity! Many people take pictures of you. You've been booked by other agencies for more interviews. Some science magazines even want to put you on the front cover as the person of the year. Every time you come to work, you wait for the sound to appear again. But nothing. You send a signal from the Juno probe, trying to make some sort of contact with whatever produced the sound. Nothing. That night, you pass out on your desk once more. Eureka moment wakes you up in the middle of the night. 
there might be something you've missed. You run the numbers again and realize that the answer was in front of you this whole time. It wasn't another civilization that produced this sound. The source was electrons. Every planet produces its own sound. It's created when charged particles from the solar wind and the planet's magnetosphere interact with one another. That's what happened on Ganymede. The electrons in its magnetic field, where the probe picked up the signal, were acting stranger than usual, and this amplified some irregular frequencies. You're embarrassed and spend the rest of your night making phone calls, telling your team the news. The agency that interviewed you releases a statement. They explain that other civilizations aren't trying to contact us. You sit back at your desk, waiting for the next big thing to happen. Europa is another of Jupiter's moons that may host life. It's made up of an iron core, a mantle, and a salty ocean, twice the volume of all the oceans on Earth. And just like Ganymede, the ocean lies under a water ice crust. Scientists claim that there might even be active volcanoes there, and some resilient bacteria may live there. With enough water, certain chemicals, and a source of energy, Europa could produce life. But it's unlikely that we'll find anything but tiny microbes.